that are coming in. Um, yeah, so you, um, uh, how big is your, your group? It's such a, um, your, uh, let's see, hold on. My research Going lab. Back. Yes, your research, yes, your lab. My research the, lab is, ooh, I want to say we probably hang around eight students and a few affiliated faculty. And then uh, I'm sort of the constant. And, yeah. but then I work at the, we're housed in the Plug-in Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Research Center within the Institute of Transportation Studies. And we're all located in like a cluster. We're just a jog off the main campus uh, in a place called West Village that has a bunch of energy and transportation research centers. So I kind of work across a lot of them. Interesting. How long have you been there? Since 2014. That's right. Yep, I thought that. Um, so, son, you don't teach. You are purely um, research. Yes. Did you, um, your background in, in psychology, did um, was sort of sustainability part of sort of your um, background before um, coming? Yeah. Into so I got a master's. What did you merge the two? I started out in I, actually. Yeah, my trajectory kind of went, I was really interested in landscape design and architecture. And then I got into psychology in college, got a bachelor in, in psychology, master's in behavior analysis, and then kind of came back around to environmental design, got my PhD in planning, but I studied environmental psychology. So that kind of brings it all together. And of course, sustainability is a big issue among environmental psychologists. Yeah, it's so interesting. We've had some really, inter really interesting interdisciplinary um, presenters this week. Um, interesting interdisciplinary backgrounds and it's always fascinating. Yeah, I was Here's looking people... through. I need to join some of the coming ones. The talks are really interesting. I recognized one of the names. Let's see, I think we'll never speak. Got a question. So um, I am about to uh, kick things off here. Um, so I would actually say if you uh, want to um, enter in some questions in the chat, we'll do that now and then we'll have an option for um, certainly participating and unmuting and asking questions in that part of the Q&A at the end as well. So I will go ahead um, and uh, do our welcome if that's all right with you, Angela. Yes, should I be seeing the chat now? Uh, no, I don't think you have to worry about any okay. of that and I will make sure to yeah, moderate as we get towards the end. All right, great. Um, thanks all for joining us tonight. Welcome to our Green Living Seminar virtual presentation. Many of you know me, I'm Elena Traster. I'm a professor here at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts um, in the Environmental Studies Department. So each year we do these Green Living Seminars and uh, they are all organized around a theme. And this year's theme is Individual Actions and Environmental Sustainability. All of these presentations are always free and open to the public. They are taking place this semester on Wednesdays at 5.30. And if you'd like to register for any of our upcoming presentations, you can do that at www.mcla.edu slash green living, one word. And you can also find a link to our YouTube channel where you can find uh, the recordings of our previous presentations from this year and last year. Um, so our presentation, we think it'll last probably about 40 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A session uh, you'll see on the bottom of your screen the little Q&A box. You're actually welcome to enter your questions anytime, uh, and they'll sit there until we get to the end of the presentation and um, we address them at that point. And at that point, also, if you would like to um, raise your hand and unmute and ask your question, uh, you'll be welcome to do that as well. Uh, a quick announcement for next week's presentation. I hope that you will come back and join us virtually for our a uh, presentation on Wednesday, March 31st, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jason Pecat, the professor of psychology at Western New England University, and his talk is titled Promoting Recycling Behaviors in Massachusetts. Today's presentation on how emissions information can help prompt travelers to purchase greener flights uh, will be given by Dr. Angela Sangavetti, research, research environmental psychologist at University of California, Davis. Angela's research interests center on how the design of the built environment, including our communities, homes, and vehicles, 
impacts our behavior and well being. She directs the Consumer Energy Interfaces Lab and brings her behavioral expertise to projects with the Plug In Hybrid Electric Vehicle Research Center, Re Revolution's Future Mobility Program, Western Cooling Efficiency Center, Center for Water Energy Efficiency, and Energy and Efficiency Institute. Dr. Sanguinetti is also director of the Co Housing Research Network which seeks to increase the impact of research establishing the personal, societal, and environmental benefits of living in collaborative neighborhoods. At UC Davis since 2014, she has worked on over 20 research grants and authored over a dozen peer-reviewed journal publications. We're really happy to have you with us today. Thanks so much. I will turn it over to you, Angela. Thank you, Elena, so much. I'm honored to be here among the other great speakers I see you have in your lineup for this seminar. It seems just like a wonderful seminar series. Um, I'm sure the students enjoy it very much. So I look forward to talking with some of you at the end of the talk. Uh, I'm going to start with some um, broader background. We're going to get to the main topic reflected in the title here, but I want to take this opportunity to also introduce you all to my research lab and the topic of ecofeedback more broadly. So the project we're gonna discuss uh, and feature today is an application of ecofeedback and that's the focus of my research lab, consumer energy interfaces or synergy, we call it synergy for short. So our lab is extremely interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary, I meaning we're making something new that can't be siloed in any one discipline. I'm bringing the behavioral science perspective. I work with a lot of design students, computer science students, cognitive science, engineering, probably more, but it's very, very diverse and graduate and undergraduate level. And we're all bringing our unique perspectives and skill sets to this topic of ecofeedback. What is ecofeedback? Well, it's essentially anytime you're providing information to people about their resource consumption, uh, whether it's how much uh, energy or water or other resources they're using or the impact that that has on the natural environment. And it has the ultimate goal of trying to nudge people into more responsible resource use. So that's ecofeedback. Now we're gonna really zoom out and kind of give some context, really broad context as to why ecofeedback is important. Um, historically, uh, for much of human history, we've had a very intimate, direct relationship with energy and natural resources, hunting and gathering our own food, building our own shelters, making fires to keep ourselves warm. That connection was there and things that we did had a very real, immediate and observable impact on the world around us. Fast forward to today, um, a lot of great things about advancements in technology. Our societies become complex. We can each have our own um, occupation and interests. We don't have to spend all of our time hunting and gathering our own food and making our own shelters and making virus to keep ourselves warm. But a result of that is we're kind of disconnected from the resources that enable us to do the things that we do. For example, many of us aren't aware where our water comes from, where our waste goes. Um, what is the portfolio of energy sources for our electric utility that's powering all the things that we do? Is it renewables? Is it all coming from dirty coal plants? We don't, most of us don't know a lot of these things. Um, famous environmental environmentalist Aldo Leopold has this quote that I love that gets at this importance for connection. So it's people need to feel that they're part of the broader natural world if they are to effectively address environmental issues and to view their welfare as related to the welfare of the natural world. So when we know that we're independent and we can see that we're independent with the natural world, we're gonna care more and we're gonna pay more attention to how our actions impact the world around us. And I really see eco-feedback as kind of trying to help make that bridge by creating some more consequences and bringing back awareness of our behavior and our resource consumption. So we're not just doing it in the dark hole, doing our activities and not knowing you know, how much energy we're using or where it's coming from or what impacts it's having. So there's really a broad scope of eco-feedback applications. Uh, there's household eco-feedback that includes things like home energy reports that you would get in the mail or online, home energy monitors, plug load monitors, like this one you see in the middle here, you just plug in an appliance and see how much energy it uses. 
And then kind of fun one on the left is a smart shower head that changes color as you're taking your shower and you can program it, for example, to turn red or even start blinking at five minutes to prompt you to get out of the shower if you're trying to use water efficiently. And then we've got um, eco-feedback applications aimed at promoting sustainable transportation. Um, in particular, there's a lot going on on car dashboards these days. It started with the Prius. The Prius was the first to have a bar chart that would have short intervals reflecting, uh, the bars would reflect how your MPG, your mileage is. So it became kind of popular for drivers to kind of make a game of it and try to get the best mileage that they could possibly get, which would annoy you if you were driving behind a Prius. Um, <laughs> but now it's becoming even more important with the more efficient vehicles, actually, the more efficient your car is the larger impact your driving behavior has on your fuel efficiency. It's more sensitive to your behavior. So we're seeing lots of varieties of what we call eco-driving feedback in vehicle dashboards. And you'll notice most eco-feedback applications are text-based, text and graphics, digital paper formats, uh, digital or paper. Some are more innovative, like the shower head that uses light. And like these examples that are really fun, and these not only are they Kind of more innovative in terms of the style, but they're also geared towards entire communities, reflecting, whereas the household and, and driver feedback is really about the individual or the individual household. You can have eco-feedback applications that reflect the behavior of entire communities and try to nudge entire communities toward more responsible behavior. The one in the middle that you're probably watching because it's moving is a student, former student of mine. We did this project where we had, um, this is our office, uh, when we used to go work at it, um, we three times during the day, the student would parade around the perimeter of the office. You can see it's all windows, so everyone inside could see him with either a green flag or a red flag. The green flag, if we were consuming less than our target energy consumption, and a red flag if we were over consuming, we needed to unplug some things and use less. Uh, also, the green flag was accompanied by the Rocky theme song we'd play when he marched with the green flag, and then the red flag went along with Darth Vader's Imperial March. So everybody really liked this. Um, and then the one on the left is called Sesame. It's another one that my lab did and the group of students. Um, well, Sesame is short for Social Energy Sensing Monument, and it's basically a 3D bar chart that uses motion, sound, and light to communicate any data that you want to communicate. It had an app that went along with it. Um, and we had it at the gym at UC Davis, and it was reflecting uh, the sustainability performance of different UC campuses. And then on the right, this is not my lab, so I wish it were. I hope we can do some cool things like this at some point, but this is in the city of Helsinki. And they had this temporary art installation where they projected green laser light onto the smokestack of the coal plant in the city. And the size of the green circle or cloud actually reflected how much energy was being saved. So that's some um, background on ecofeedback. So my lab works on a lot of different applications of ecofeedback. We work on the design side and developing our own applications and also a lot on the evaluation side, looking at what works and what doesn't and theory as well. So the project we're gonna focus on today is Green Fly. And again, we're gonna give a little more background before we get into that one as to why it's important and how the idea came about. Um, so you all probably know that air travel really is emissions intensive. For many of us, it's the biggest part of our carbon footprint. So we're gonna, for a moment, consider Kate. This is a persona we've made up, but there are people like this out there. She does everything right. She checks every box for her sustainable lifestyle. She doesn't have a car, uses public transportation, energy efficient home that she shares. Um, maybe she lives in a co-op, you know, she's a vegetarian. She does all these things. She probably recycles and all the good things. But, oh, and her carbon footprint as a result is much less than uh, the rest of us average uh, North Americans. But she also flies across the country a couple times a year, maybe to visit family, and she goes to Hawaii for vacation every year. And just with that, she's now, her carbon footprint is about equivalent 
to the average North Americans. So you can do everything right, but flying really is a big chunk of our individual carbon footprint. And another problem is that we don't really know this when we go to buy a flight. I mean, and most of you probably are aware of the emissions of flying and lots of us are, but we're not reminded of it when we go to make a purchase. So this is the interface you see on Google Flights when you go to get your flight. There's nothing on here about carbon emissions. I'm not picking on Google. It's the same thing if you go to Priceline or Expedia or Kayak or any of the airlines. They don't give you emissions information. So it's very hard to be prompted to think about it and consider it um, in your decision making. So what are, what are the solutions? Well, I know the focus of the seminar series is on individual behavior, but just as context and to think about some of the broader solutions, there are sustainable jet fuels being developed. A lot of research is going on on biofuels. Um, and that's going to be a really big deal. There's also carbon taxes that could be just integrated into the purchase price of your ticket. That's another strategy. It's more on the policy side. In terms of what we can do as individuals, we can voluntarily buy carbon offsets. We can just not fly. That's been pretty easy for a lot of us the past year. Uh, we can fly less. Or in the focus of the Green Flight Project is this idea of choosing lower emissions flights. So I do want to talk a little bit about buying carbon offsets because um, choosing lower emissions flights isn't something that's easy to do because you can't see the emissions of the flights that you're buying. Um, that's kind of why we have this new project, but you can very readily buy carbon offsets if that's something that you want to do. So I want to make sure everyone knows that that opportunity is out there. You can buy them from companies like the Sustainable Travel International, where I got this infographic. And that allows you to kind of offset the emissions that were associated with your air travel. And that's per person emissions. So you're sharing the emissions of the flight with everyone else on it. You're not taking responsibility for all the emissions. But um, then there's TerraPass is another website where you can go and buy carbon offsets. This is what their website looks like. You put in how long your flight was and it makes a recommendation as to how much you should buy in carbon offsets. Now, if you don't know how long your flight was in terms of distance, then you have to look that up. And of course, this is a separate website and payment process than your flight purchase that you got on Google or Delta Airlines or wherever you bought your flight. So you have to go and do that. Um, some research has been done on buying carbon offsets and consumers' willingness to purchase carbon offsets. Um, I should also note that Carbon offsets tend to be priced at around $10 to $25 per metric ton of CO2. So um, in research on willingness to pay for offsets or a carbon tax, um, most people are willing to pay for a carbon tax if you put it into the ticket price. And most in this research were willing to pay about the going rate of carbon offsets, about $25 per ton. But when you ask them if they would do this voluntarily, uh, much, uh, a much smaller number of people said that they would. So convenience is a, is a really important factor. If you have to go make an effort and go somewhere else to get it done and put in your credit card information again to get it done, uh, that's, that's not going to be as effective. So here we get to the solution that we're really focused on with green flight, which is choosing lower emissions flights. So it's not well known because you don't get to see the emissions information on flight alternatives when you buy a flight, that the emissions for different flight choices that you may have for the same trip, same origin, same destination, can vary by a factor of two or even more. And that's because, well, one of the main factors is layovers. A lot of the fuel used and the emissions generated from flights occur at takeoff and landing. So if you have layovers, you have more takeoffs and landings. Um, but the route also matters, the aircraft type and size matters, occupancy, as well as fuel type matters. So in other words, you could reduce your air travel carbon footprint by up to 50%, you could half it, or maybe even reduce it more just by simply choosing 
the most efficient light. But again, that's only if you know what the emissions are. So that's where GreenFly came in. We thought, okay, well, we need to make a flight search interface that prioritizes emissions information, makes it salient, so it can be added to the equation when people are, are making decisions about which flight to purchase. So this is our website, GreenFly, and it's much like any of the others in that you put in where you're gonna go and when. Then there are several features in the output about emissions. So it sorts the flights from lowest emissions to highest. There's also a label. They're labeled your green fly. The flights with the lowest emissions are, have this badge, your green fly. The bar at the top is showing the range of emissions for the flight options for your trip, lowest, highest, and average in the middle. And so it's just showing uh, the interactions of the website and how you can default sort by emissions. You could also opt to sort by price. And again, the highlighting using a couple different strategies to highlight the lowest emissions flight, a green nor green fly label, green text, and a bar at the top that shows the minimum value of emissions. And then a little bit about the website. And we used the Google Flights API to pull information on the different flight uh, itineraries and alternatives based on destinations and dates. We took that, triangulated with some other data sources to get information on routes and on aircraft types. We built our own flight carbon calculator that that information went into to determine the uh, emissions values for each flight. And then of course, because we're a university and not a business, we weren't involved with payment transactions. So we could just only, the best we could do would be to link to airlines so that you could a user could go to the airline's website and purchase the flight. Unfortunately, Google Flights Google, uh, made their API well, it's no longer free. So our website doesn't function anymore. There's a demo up, um, but we unfortunately can't use their API anymore, which our site was built around. So maybe one day they'll open that back up, but we can still do research. And that was the whole point was to demonstrate this idea, try to encourage others to do this and to do research to determine whether or not it's effective. So. I want to share now with you our, our research on this topic. And the main question being, does making emissions information available and prominent in the flight search interface nudge consumers toward purchasing greener flights? We've done two experiments. So now I'm going to go over each of those in turn. With the first one, um, we're wondering, just on the most basic level, how much are people willing to pay for lower emissions flights? if they see that information. And then also recognizing that non-stops are already uh, more desirable and they're lower emissions. We wanna know in particular and pinpoint how much more are people willing to pay for a non-stop because um, they're already gonna be more willing to pay for a non-stop without emissions information, but how much more are they willing to pay for it when they also see that it's the lower emissions option. What we did was a, what's called a discrete choice experiment where you present different options to people that vary uh, in terms of attributes of interest and you have them make a selection and it's usually having to do with consumer behavior. So we asked people to imagine their last flight and pick which alternative they would choose from a selection that varied in terms of cost, the amount of carbon emissions and whether it was a nonstop or a layover flight. And you can see an example question here and how it kind of mimics the green fly interface with the greenest flight badge on the option with the lowest emissions, which also happens to be a nonstop one in this particular question. For this experiment, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk to recruit participants. So this is a crowdsourcing um, work 
platform. You can go on as what's called a requester for a worker. You can go on as a requester and put tasks out into the world and offer money for people to complete them. So for researchers, it's a quick way to get a lot of data. And for workers, you can go on and get paid to do different and interesting and very diverse tasks. So our participants were all adults living in the U.S. We made sure that they all had experience flying and also purchasing their own plane tickets so they'd be familiar with that process. And we had just over a thousand respondents. For our analysis, what we did was calculate a willingness to pay metric, which is common with this kind of analysis and methodology of the discrete choice experiment. And we calculated that willingness to pay for each of three different scenarios. The first being, um, how much more will people pay for a lower carbon option if we show them only layover flights or only nonstop flights? So in other words, we're trying to keep that variable constant. So if we only change the cost and the carbon, how much more are people willing to pay just to have the lower carbon? Then we wanted to know, for, and these two, last two are related, um, what are they willing to pay for a nonstop flight versus a layover if we keep carbon constant? So sort of pretending it's not there, like is the naturalistic case in any of these flight search interfaces where you don't see carbon? We had it there, it was just the same for all the options. So it didn't vary. So it wasn't a factor in people's decisions. So we just wanted to see just the baseline, how much more people pay for a nonstop versus a layover. And then we'll compare that with how much more, number three, how much more will people pay for a nonstop flight when they see that it also has lower carbon compared to a layover flight. And then the analysis was conducted in our statistical software for statisticians out there. It was conditional logistic regression model, which assumes a linear function and it comes up with an equation with values for each of these attributes, carbon cost, uh, not cost, carbon layovers. And oh, that's it. That's it. So our results for this experiment, for the first scenario, uh, we found a willingness to pay for lower carbon flights at a rate of $192 per metric ton. Um, and so this is, again, not considering whether it's a layover or a nonstop flight. So remember the price that we looked at for offsets. On the high end, you would typically pay at most $25 a metric ton for carbon offsets. Compare that to what we found by integrating this kind of information into the flight search website. People were willing to pay at a much higher rate for lower carbon flights. Now, that doesn't mean that they'll pay $192 more for the ticket for their flight because the flight alternatives don't vary as much as a metric ton. So putting it another way, um, according to our model, these two flights would be equally desirable to our, the participants in this study. Uh, if you presented these people with these two options, either a $438 nonstop flight that had 381 kilograms of carbon emissions or a $420 nonstop flight that had 475, that would be kind of a toss up. People would be kind of equally inclined to pick either of those. And then it comes to our second and third scenario, scenarios where we're trying to kind of um, see what it, do the comparison of what people would pay for a nonstop flight without carbon information versus with. On the left here, so without carbon information, and again, what that looked like was just we gave them options that all had the same amount of carbon, but holding that constant, they were willing to pay on average $51 more for a nonstop flight compared to a one layover or for a one layover compared to a two layover. So I'll give you $51 more to avoid that layover because it's a hassle. But on the right, when we did vary the level, the carbon information, which is more realistic because the nonstop flights will be um, less emissions, people were willing to pay $83 to avoid that layover when they also saw that it was the greenest. And that amount got even higher, the bigger the difference was in the emissions um, between the options. So moving on to experiment two, 
And what we wanted to know was would the results be similar with another population? So we had used Amazon Mechanical Turk. We wanted to test it out with a different group of people. And then we also had this idea about looking at uh, multi-airport airport regions or the um, just the airport selection as another variable. So as much as 40% of flights originate from an area that has multiple airports. So people have options of which airport they could potentially use. Um, so we wanted to know, can em emissions information sway travelers to use a less preferred airport in the region, maybe one that's slightly less convenient to get to or a little further away, but maybe offers more nonstop flights. So this time we did our study right at home with UC Davis, faculty, staff, postdocs, and graduates, anyone at the campus who may travel for work because we used the business travel context. So we had 477 participants. We asked them to imagine they were gonna have a, a business trip in either Washington DC or London. Well, we asked everybody about both of those. They got scenarios for each, the domestic trip and the international trip. And for each of those destinations, we had a series of questions where they picked from a selection of flights, very much like experiment one. And also like experiment one, the flight options varied in terms of cost, carbon, nonstop versus layover. But in this case, we also added an airport. So for our region, so Davis, California is very close to Sacramento. So SMF airport in Sacramento is the closest for most of us. But there's also SFO in San Francisco. San Francisco International Airport offers a lot more nonstop flights and it's about an hour from Davis with no traffic, which is rare. So it is reasonable and we do often pick one or the other. And what we found was overall, our model yielded a willingness to pay of $184 per ton. So the UC Davis faculty and staff were willing to pay more for lower carbon flights on average across all scenarios at a rate of $104 per ton of CO2 spare. And again, we, can, we have to compare that to that $25 per ton for offsets. And it's very consistent with what we found in experiment one, $192 per ton that was with the mechanical Turk sample. So that was good for us to see that two very different samples um, so UC Davis experiment was very much the business travel use case, uh, whereas in Turk, we asked them to imagine their last trip, which may have been business or pleasure trip. So it was pretty consistent. And then we found something interesting uh, in terms of the preferred and non-preferred airports. So our model predicted that travelers would pay about the same to either avoid a layover or to fly from their preferred airport. So if you had one flight, like for me, my preferred airport would be SMF and SEC. It's a lot easier to get to. If I had a layover flight for $383 out of SAC versus a nonstop out of SFO for $375, that would be a big toss up because they're kind of equally valuable to me. But if you, and once you add in the carbon emissions information, it can tip the balance in favor of the greener flight. It adds kind of the second pro. So there's now two pros and one con to that flight. I have to get to SFO, but I have a nonstop flight that I wanted anyways. And now I feel better about choosing that because I also am choosing the greener option. So I get there. And by the way, we did take into account ground travel, emissions from ground travel. And it's still, even if you drive a little bit further to an airport for a nonstop flight, you're going to be saving more carbon than going to the close airport for a flight with layovers. And then we also did a, did a study looking at all the data from UC Air Travel that's registered through the accounting department at UC Davis. And I won't go into the details of the methodology, but it's a very involved study to try to model what would happen if we used a green pilot interface for the UC Davis travel portal. 
that about half of staff and students use when they travel. You can go into this um, website it's called Aggie Travel because our mascot's Aggie, which is a horse. So lots of people don't use it and they just go on Google Flights or, or whatever they want to use. But those who do use it, um, if we could get a Greenfly-like interface onto that site, and our model was predictive of how that would influence people's behavior, we were able to extrapolate and estimate that the university would save about, would reduce the carbon footprint of employee air travel by about 4%, which didn't seem really compelling to us. We were hoping it would be more, it's still something. And the University of California has a goal of being carbon neutral by 2025 and doesn't include um, air travel, but they're getting to the point where they're also going to be setting goals for what's called scope three emissions. Air travel falls into scope three emissions, uh, which are kind of like things that don't happen directly on campus but are associated with it. Um, so it's still something and it's still a big deal. But then what was compelling was that that reduction in carbon was associated with $56,000 in savings because what our model showed was that uh, people would end up choosing nonstop flights that were available in SFO that are actually cheaper than layover flights that are available in Sacramento. So this is very context dependent, might not be all the case for all multi-airport regions. I don't know, I'm sure you, you guys probably are in a, a multi-airport region in Massachusetts. Um, and so I'm not sure it would, because it, it could potentially work the other direction in, in an institution that implements something like this might be spending more. Of course, they could frame that as an investment in carbon reductions. And this was why we looked at, at the impact on costs too, because we, we were afraid the university wouldn't want to implement something or would be hesitant and would really need to take into consideration what the financial impact would be of encouraging everyone to take potentially more expensive flights, as we do think of nonstops as sometimes being more expensive. So in conclusion, what we believe is that this is a really important strategy and it's not being utilized. Um, having emissions information during flight, ser flight search could really nudge consumers towards picking flights that are lower emissions and, and they would do that, it seems very readily from our data. And so the strategy could be adopted by airlines and their travel booking websites, flight search engine companies like Google Flights, Expedia, Priceline, Kayak, all the rest. Uh, very easily, very easily. And institutions like the University of California and other large institutions that have private vendors supplying an employee travel booking service. For example, ours that I mentioned, Aggie Travel, does have emissions information in it, but you have to open up each flight alternative, you have to expand it, and then you could see, so you could expand one flight option, write down the carbon, expand another, write down the carbon, and then compare them. But it's not like our green fly interface that really prioritizes and tries to make that information salient and persuasive. Um, but the university could insist that they reorganize it. And Google Flights and the rest are, very, are more than well enough equipped to do something like this and they could um, create a carbon. So we created our own flight carbon calculator, but they could very easily create one. Um, so we really want to get the word out on um, this strategy so that it can be adopted by these companies. Still though, it's only part of the solution. It's not everything. We think it could be combined with other approaches, um, such as encouraging fewer flights. That's still important, even if you take the most, uh, the lowest emissions flight, it's still going to be a large portion of your carbon footprint because flying just is a lot. There's no way around that. Also, there needs to be more educational and contextual information about emissions. So even though it had quite an effect on people, we did hear from people in our studies that they didn't really understand in a concrete way what a certain amount of carbon meant and that that would have been meaningful. Interestingly, in our first experiment, we presented carbon emissions information in kilograms. And in the second one, we did in pounds. 
and we still found very similar results. So in the pounds, that was because we thought it would be more meaningful to Americans because pounds, we're not on the metric system, pounds kind of resonate more with us, we know what that is. And also pounds are smaller um, size units, so the number is bigger, and we thought that would be more impactful to have larger numbers of emissions, it looks like more, it feels like more. Um, and one very clever person pointed out that, in fact, if you put that money, instead of buying the lower emission spike for more, if you put that much money towards offsets, because offsets are so much cheaper when you look at those rates, you could buy way more offsets. You could offset 10 people's flights if, if you're willing to pay as much on offsets as you are for the greener flight. But it's just that trick. Um, it's really about choice architecture, the behavioral economics concept. It's a trick of presenting the information in such a way that people are willing to do it. They're willing to get the greener flight. And it's not even about how much difference there is in carbon emissions or whether they know if that difference is significant and why. And then we also think there's a great opportunity to integrate the purchasing of carbon offsets in flight pricing, or at least to ha somehow have a one-stop shop. You just have to enter your credit card info once on one website and you can get your offsets when you get your, your flight ticket. And then finally, we think this will be a really good strategy too as biofuels become more prevalent and airlines are gonna to want to um, really publicize that they're using sustainable fuels. If we could have, you could imagine an interface that has badges for biofuels on the flights that are powered by biofuels in the same way we would expect that to influence consumer behavior too and help promote um, renewable um, jet fuels. And uh, we're hoping also that all these things could have an industry-wide impact as well. If enough institutions or flight search companies were using them, the airlines would probably be motivated to prioritize their emissions and getting biofuels more so than they are now. Um, so all these things we think are related. Our strategy is part of the puzzle and all these other things are important as well. And I would like to acknowledge my partner in this research, Professor Nina Amenta of our computer science department. This was her brainchild from the get-go and we worked together on this all along and we've, we've had tons of great talented students involved from computer science design and statistics department departments and we enjoy funding from the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. And with that, I would love to open it up for questions or to hear the questions from Elena. Wonderful, thank you very much. I, um, I It's fascinating. And uh, we do have one question. I always have a whole list of questions, but I'd like to so encourage um, our, our attendees, do feel free to, um, Add any questions in here. Also feel free if you want, you should be able to raise your hand and we should be able to figure out how to unmute you if you wanna ask a question. Um, so the first one was uh, that uh, we have here, the first question was, um, uh, Marion, we're glad that you're joining us, was um, if you buy a carbon offset, um, where does the money go? Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends on where you're buying the offset. They usually offer different programs. Um, so some you can pick and choose where it would go, but it could go to things like large renewable energy projects like solar farms um, or tree planting. There's really a variety and there's different sites and ways depending on how, you know, if you want to be more or less involved in determining where those funds go, you can, you can find something. But I do recommend that terrapass.com to check out. Um, so, um, all right, so, uh, you know, I guess my, one of my questions, maybe you sort of uh, answered it, it sounds like Greenfly was sort of available, but now it sounds like there isn't necessarily a path forward for something like this to be like, uh, it would just be great. I'm a, the coordinator of Campus Sustainability at MCLA, and I, I would love to see, you know, our, um, 
our institution related to travel, you know, to be purchased through something like this, but it sounds like there isn't a, a plan for when this may be available. Is that right? No, so um, as far as our tool, no, unfortunately. And we did, at one point, we were even looking at like business models and should we try to do something like that, but it didn't make sense for us as researchers. Um, but there are, so it depends on what vendor your campus is using, but you might look and see, and ours has changed names and there's like parent companies and umbrellas. So I think it's something like Connexus or Concur, something like that. They do a lot, they're, they're the vendor for a lot of universities. And so we do know that they have different interfaces, different versions that you can pick. And we do know that they have a carbon calculator, so they can have that information. So if you already have that, um, you're so much closer to it. It's just a matter of have, working with them to reorganize the information. And that's our next step at UC Davis is to try to do that. And we could do uh, applied experiments and see what people, what flights people are purchasing with the current interface versus if we can get them to, to modify it to make the information more salient. And there have been plugins in the past. There have been a couple plugins that you can get and add. So it's kind of like a pop-up that comes up when you're searching in Priceline or wherever. Um, the the add the add-in would come up and do the calculations for carbon, but they were kind of a great ideas. And the only thing like what we've done that we've found um, before, but it was a little bit awkward because it wasn't integrated in the website and they have not been maintained. So they're defunct at this point too. I have another question. Um, uh, I think it's a question uh, from Cindy. Um, have some of the climate change efforts such as 350.org been asked to have their members to write or even boycott airlines or booking sites until the carbon cost is provided. So wow, what a great point. I don't know of any effort like that, but that would be so cool if they did. <laughs> it makes so much sense that it should it should be provided. I, I don't know why it hasn't been. I don't know what kind of pressures or efforts there have been to get it done. Or even like who would you, I guess, It'd be one thing to approach the airlines and then another to, to approach the flight search engine companies. Following up on what you found at, at Davis, and it's so interesting that um, you know there was such a, you know, in addition to the to the emissions benefit, also the financial benefit, um, seems like a surprise. Has the institution been receptive to um, incorporating this kind of approach in, um, you know, I think they will be when we finally pin them down. We have, a, we have a, a, a very active sustainability office and, uh, we're trying to get a meeting scheduled. Well, so then this is, um, related, but really kind of bringing it back to MCLA, where we do, do also have a um, small but active uh, sustainability initiative. And so I'm just wondering, this is such an interesting example of uh, eco feedback and how it can be used on um, campuses. And if you have other examples or advice of ways that eco feedback could be harnessed effectively as part of a campus sustainability effort. Yes, absolutely. And at Davis, I work a lot with the Energy Conservation Office. That's part of our facilities management department. And they have a couple of really progressive things going on that other campuses do not, and they get called upon a lot um, to share. And one of those is a campus, it's called the Campus Energy Education Dashboard, SEED. And we have partnered with them to do a little user research on it. But um, that's a really good example of a campus-wide um, dashboard to show energy use and, and educate the campus community about because um, it shows the energy use intensity of all the buildings on campus and so it's educational about what what factors are related to energy use in campus buildings like lab buildings use the most because of the kinds of equipment they have and things like that and then we have another really fun project that's called thermostat with an extra o because cows are iconic of Davis, we have a lot of cows and agriculture, so thermostat, and the mascot is Jules the cow. But 
But Thermostat is a crowdsourcing app where from buildings on campus, you can go onto the app and report whether you're too hot or too cold in the space. And the facilities takes that information to be more proactive about managing um, uh, thermostat set points for both occupant comfort and energy efficiency. So that's been a really fun one for students to it's like the it's very engaging for the campus community to have that. And it's uh, the research that I've done with that was to show that just giving occupants that occupant that opportunity to provide feedback, even though it doesn't get addressed right away. If you say you're too hot, the AC doesn't kick on. But just being able to vent that, if you will, to the facilities um, leads to greater satisfaction with campus spaces. That makes sense. Um, so I have one more question. So I do want to encourage any anyone, don't be shy if you, uh, again, feel free. Oh, good, Tyler. We always love to hear from you. So I, let's see, can I, yes, I can allow you to talk. All right, I'm going to do that and you should be able to unmute and um, ask away here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Uh, great. Yeah, I was wondering, are cruise ships any greener than aircrafts? I have no idea. It's a great question. Cruise ships. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that, but that's a really interesting question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Tyler always has great questions. We appreciate yeah, I could. I know I could ask someone. So if we wanted to follow up via email, I definitely have people that I work with that would know that, or that's more their wheelhouse. Sure, I'd be happy to follow up with that if you um, share, yeah. I can share it out. Yeah, I'll ask them. Super. Um, so yes, and so another shout out. If others, others have questions they want to share, you feel free to type them in the uh, box here or raise your hand. And I will ask my uh, my last question here. Um, and so I'm just uh, curious. Uh, the first this is the first time I think I've heard about the sort of um, uh, community wide nudge efforts. You know, the the guy walking around with the flag. Um, and I'm curious um, about how successful those are and in comparison to the more sort of individual kind of feedback you know is that effective um with uh, how we behave as humans yeah it, it really is uh there hasn't been a lot of research on it because most of the research is on and particularly on household energy feedback because that stuff dates back to the 70s with people putting flyers on doors and having uh, energy monitors but the limited research that does exist does show that having that social element can make it more effective because, um, well, there's the competition element. So some studies have shown that having that like, competition, friendly competition between different, that's usually in like, commercial spaces, so different office spaces or at, uh, universities too. It's been a big thing in universities. And so usually like one-off case studies where they do some initiative and there's competition involved. So it's hard to say if it works better or worse than anything. But um, also it creates the sort of just public accountability. So that's another lever of influence that can be really effective. It's just people are all seeing the same thing and you all know that what you're doing is either on track or, or not on track. You can't hide it. A really uh, funny study with the home energy feedback that was really innovative. We've never seen anything else like it before or since, but they put the home energy feedback on the outside of the home. So it was telling people outside the home how you were performing inside the home. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, that's great. I have not, not heard of that approach either. <laughs> um, so uh, we got a question from Jay Thoman. Uh, thanks, Jay. Let's see. It says, uh, how about including options rather than flying in the interface, uh, CO2 emissions for driving, boating, or even no travel at all to set a zero baseline. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, with Green Fly, we had a focus on flying and air travel, but I had a student in our lab who did, it was a design master's student who for her thesis created this really cool app called EcoTrips where you could put in whatever mode you were using and it would, it would build your carbon footprint. And it would, she had all these interesting uh, metrics where she converted um, energy and 
into interesting units, like uh, instead of just giving you carbon emissions, she would say how many seconds of volcano eruption that was equivalent to, or for fossil fuel use for your driving, she would convert that to how many pounds of prehistoric matter. So she had like a dinosaur icon. So you knew like how, it was, it was really clever, but it was definitely about multi, multi, multiple modes. So yeah, that's a great point to have a holistic picture of your transportation carbon footprint. Yeah, I, I love that idea. I hope to see some of these um, projects come to fruition. All right, and then this is actually just a um, data. So thank you to Susan Abrams who yeah. did a little research here. Uh, so from the New York Times, June 2019, we have our answer to, to Tyler's question. Brian Kilmer, researcher at the International Council on Clean Transportation and Nonprofit Research Group, said that even the most efficient cruise ships emit three to four times yeah. more carbon dioxide per passenger mile than a jet. Hmm. Who knew? Thank you very much for that, Susan. Yeah. Appreciate it. Very interesting. All right. So I'm not seeing any more hands. I'm not seeing any more questions. And we were just about at the end anyway. So I'm going to take then um, this. Uh, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to again uh, thank our attendees for joining us today and uh, invite you to come back again next week. And Angela, thanks so much. This has been fascinating. Um, I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed it as well. All right. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>